Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Flynn. I am the City Council President. Viewers can watch the City Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city council dash TV. I'd like to ask my colleagues and those in the audience to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to also ask all of us to be respectful of each other. Do not disrupt the meeting while you are here. If you are disruptive, you'll be asked to leave, and if you fail to comply, you could be escorted out. I'd also note that according to city council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Clerk, can we please call the roll to ascertain? It's ridiculous that the Boston City Council- can, Mr. Clerk, can, can you please, can you please? There's the security. Mr. Clerk, can you please call the roll to ascertain the quorum of a presence? We're in a brief recess. Mr. Clerk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Councillor Arroyo, Councillor Baker, Councillor Braden, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Durkin, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Flynn, Councillor Lara, Councillor Louisian, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, and Councillor Worrell. Quorum is present. Thank you. Can, Mr. Clerk, can you ensure that the record is reflected? Councilor Tanya Fernandez Anderson is present. I have been informed by the clerk that the quorum is present. Today's clergy is passed to Michael Payne, invited by City Councilor Brian Worrell. Councilor Worrell, would you like to come to the podium and um, introduce our clergy? And, and, and introduce our clergy for today. Excuse me, there's no, there's no interrupting this meeting. There are no signs in this meeting. I made it clear at the beginning. Can you please take down the signs and can you let us continue the meeting? Council Worrell, would you please come forward? Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. We're introducing our clergy right now. You're not even going to say anything about the issue. It's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to a city that calls itself progressive. We're in a brief recess. We are back in session. Mr. Clerk, can the record be reflected that Council Baker is present? Council Lara is present. Council Arroyo is present. I'd like to ask Council Orell to please come forward. Good afternoon. Um, today I have the honor of 
Introducing Pastor Michael A. Payne, a pastor, worship leader, speaker, musician, and songwriter, a talented brother. Originally from Brooklyn, uh, his ministry, began, uh, ministry experience began with choir directing at the age of 12, which led to working with choirs and church music ministries throughout the East Coast. At 17, Michael responded to the call from God to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1996, Michael moved to Massachusetts and attended Eastern Nazarene College where he earned his degree in religion. This led him to serving as the youth pastor and worship leader at the Second Church in Dorchester. While also ministering and traveling with his community choir, affectionately known as Michael Payne and Redeemed Praise, in 2013, Michael was ordained and served as the associate pastor slash pastor of worship and arts at the Second Church in Dorchester. In 2019, he transitioned to intern pastor of worship and arts for Kingdom Life Ministry in Raina, Mass. Today, he and his wife, Diane, are establishing the Align Worship Center in Boston, Mass, a ministry that is passionate about teaching, being in alignment with God's love and his power to shape community. Michael has not shied away from sharing his own personal testimony of God's love, deliverance, and power in his life. As he continues to advance God's kingdom, he does it alongside the two, of love of, two loves of his life, his wife Diane and the daughter Malaya. Without further introduction, Pastor Michael. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pastor Michael Payne. Um, as as uh, Counselor Warrell mentioned, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I was hoping to hear some ooh, so I just... Um, <laughs> This morning, uh, just before I pray, I, I wanted to just deliver just a quick word to you. Um, I was hoping to come with a special message or a special saying from Martin Luther King or from some famous poet, but I got a, worse, a really wonderful message from a special young lady named Malia Payne. She's a philosopher at the age of eight, and she woke up this morning and called Daddy and said, Daddy, have a great day today. And I said, okay, thank you. Don't forget, I'm going to City Hall today. And the first thing she did was smile. And she said, Daddy, go tell Mayor Wu I said hi. <laughs> and she had this look on her face like, I know the mayor, so go tell her. And I'm like, sweetie, I don't know the mayor like that. And she said, that's okay, go tell the mayor I said hi. And for me, it was special because just recently, she lost her aunt. Her mom is in, in St. Martin. Um, uh, bearing her, her, her sister right now, and it's a very difficult time for my daughter. But to hear that her daddy is going to see Mayor Wu was just like, wow. Just something about saying hi to someone who has some level of authority or power. And I think that's a good message for us in the midst of all the stuff that you and I may be dealing with today. That sometimes when we are looking for sense, some sense of hope Maybe we just want to have a moment to say hi to someone with power. So this moment, as we get to get ready to, to pray, we are praying to the one who has power. For anyone that may be struggling with something right now, this is a moment for us to say, hi, God, we need you right now because we know that you have power. And if you're dealing with something, I know the things I'm dealing with. I'm, a, I'm dealing with some health issues at the moment, and there are moments I need to say, God, hi. And you know what? He answers. So can we pray together? And let's be in, in oneness and one accord as we talk to, the, to God today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And in the midst of fire, as we read in the Bible, we see that when the three Hebrew boys were in the fire, you were there with them. And today, we need a moment where we can experience you here with us in the midst of so much fire. Many of us are dealing with things that we cannot explain. Our city is dealing with a lot of different issues. But today, we are praying to you, asking for your guidance in this room, as well as for our city. We need you for our city, for those who are hurting, for those who are disenfranchised. We need you. And even when we feel we don't see you actually working uh, uh, visibly, we're asking that God that we can have some sense of awareness and acknowledgement that as we look to you, 
that your, we can see that your eyes are upon us and that you have not left us nor forsaken us. So today we ask that your Holy Spirit will just be here and guide all the conversation, all the discussions there, Father, for your glory. God, I pray even today for anyone under the sound of my voice who needs a hello moment, that today that they'll realize that no matter where they feel they are with seeing you or knowing you, that they can pause and say, God, hello, I need you because I know you have power. And I pray, Father, that you will respond back saying, I'm here, I have power, and I love you today. So God, we thank you for this day. Despite, their Father, what may have been going on through our morning, we know that, dear God, that this day is your time, your opportunity to do something wonderful. So we say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you. Could everyone please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Payne. We have one presentation today, and I had the opportunity to invite this group. It's my honor to welcome members of the Massachusetts Association of Women in Law Enforcement here to the City Council today. This is a diverse group of women in law enforcement in our city, in our state, representing a wide range of departments and agencies across the Commonwealth, including but not limited to local police departments, campus police departments, corrections, judicial systems, and other agencies. This professional group um, has, a, has a, a number of women dedicated to the field of public safety, law enforcement, and they're active in educating and helping other women through education, through training, and through mentoring. It's a tremendous resource and support for women in law enforcement across the Commonwealth. I will now ask members of the Massachusetts Association of Women in Law Enforcement um, to please join me here at the podium. And the representative for today is Amy Lee DeVito from the Boston Police Department. I would like to ask Amy Lee to talk a little about this wonderful organization and maybe introduce some of your colleagues as well. And again, want to say to everyone here, welcome. And we are fortunate to have you, but you play a critical role in, in our city, in our state, and women police officers are doing a tremendous job. So we want to acknowledge the professional work that you have been doing. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Yeah. Come on up, everybody. Good morning, uh, councillors, staff, uh, those in attendance. Uh, as Councillor Flynn said, my name is Amy DeVito. I'm currently the Vice President-Elect of the Massachusetts Association of Women in Law Enforcement, or as we call it, MOLLE. On behalf of my organization, thank you for having us here today and for this invitation. Um, as Councillor Flynn mentioned, we are a statewide organization. We do, as, even though most of us here are from the Boston Police Department, we represent all women in all law enforcement roles across the state. Unfortunately, my fellow board members cannot be here today, but they are from Wellesley Police, Massachusetts State Police, and Babson College. Our newly elected secretary is the superintendent of the Norfolk County Sheriff's Department. Our members hail from corrections, sheriffs, district attorney's offices, the DCR Park Ranges, CJIS, and numerous small and large municipal and campus state police departments. We were formed 20 years ago in 2003 with the objective to keep women in law enforcement informed and connected while focusing on the positive aspects of our work. To achieve this, we do many things. We host an annual award ceremony. We award a graduating senior with a scholarship in honor of one of our late presidents, Lieutenant June T. Murphy. We also host an annual conference, which I just had the pleasure of running in the, this fall. It provides training and networking opportunities for attendees. Officer Woods, my classmate and I uh, run a summer camp every summer where we introduce young females to positive female role models in law enforcement. 
and let them know this job isn't just for the boys. We do all of this because we understand that women in law enforcement, sworn and civilian, share common experiences. So we collaborate on ways to improve the status of women in a field where they are underrepresented, which is why we appreciate an opportunity like this to present a different view than what most people think of when they picture law enforcement. Today we represent approximately 14% of the Boston Police Department. But thanks to Commissioner Cox pledging to the 30 by 30 initiative this year, we plan to improve that representation to 30% by 2030, and hopefully with the help of City Hall, we are able to do that. We are a vibrant, diverse group focused on making positive changes to law enforcement, not only for ourselves, but our agencies and our communities. Again, on behalf of Molly, thank you for inviting us here today. Thank you, counselors. Thank you. I would like to ask my colleagues to please come up for a photo as we present a resolution. I would like to ask Councilor Flaherty, who is the chair of the committee, if he would please um, present this citation. Thank you, Council President Flynn. As Chair of Public Safety, on behalf of our colleagues here, be it resolved that the Boston City Council extends its appreciation to the Massachusetts Association of Women in Law Enforcement, Molly, in recognition for your work in providing resources to women in the field of law enforcement, promoting professionalism among your members, and supporting women officers through training and mentoring. Be it resolved that the Boston City Council extends its best wishes to your organization in your future endeavors that this resolution be duly signed by the President of the Boston City Council and attested to in a copy transmitted to the city clerk uh, on behalf of all of us here. Congratulations and Thank for the work you do. Someone behind me? Come on up here. You got it? We're on to the approval of the minutes. <coughs> Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, please say aye. All opposed say nay. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communications from Her Honor the Mayor. Mr. Clerk, can you please read dockets 1747 and 1748, please? Docket number 1747, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $352,270 in the form of a grant for fiscal year 23 Fair Housing Assistance Program awarded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to be administered by the Boston Fair Housing and Equity Commission. The grant will fund processing and training costs related to housing discrimination complaints received by the Boston Housing and Equity Commission. Docket number 1748, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $304,430 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 24 Fair Housing Assistance Program awarded by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development to be administered by the Office of Fair Housing and Equity. The grant will fund processing and training costs related to housing discrimination complaints received by the Boston Fair Housing and Equity Commission. Thank you. This stock at 1747 and 1748 will be referred to the Committee on Housing and Community Development. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1749? 
docket number 1749. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $175,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 COPS CD micro grant community policing development awarded by the United States Department of Justice to be administered by the Police Department. The grant will fund building trust and legitimacy within community building. With COPS Community Development Microfunding, the Boston Police Department will hire two full-time BRIC data uh, analysts to work with the Bureau of Field Services and the 11 district captains and community service officers. The Bureau of Community Engagement to help connect with an even wider range of community partners. Other bureaus will add data and information to the community comp staff meetings. And the Office of Research and Development Civilian Hub Program Coordinator will operate six district hub table convening per week throughout the neighborhoods of Boston. Thank you. This docket 1749 will be referred to the Committee on Public Safety, Criminal Justice. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1750-1751? Docket number 1750, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Kevin Reedy as a member of the Boston Landmarks Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. And docket number 1751, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Fadi Samaha as a, a commissioner of the Boston Landmarks Commission for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. Thank you. These dockets 1750, 1751 will be referred to the Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation. We're going to reports of public offices and others. <coughs> Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1752 through 1769? Docket number 1752, communication was received by the City Clerk from the Board of Election Commissioners, certifying the results of the election held for the offices of City Councilor at Large and District City Councilors on November 7, 2023 at the Municipal Election in Boston. Docket number 1753. Notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Jim Kennedy as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1754. Notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Betsy Cowan Neptune as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1755. Notice we received from the Mayor the appointment of Jared Wright as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1756. Notice we received from the Mayor the appointment of Khalid Mustafa as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1757. The notice was, notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Caroline DePaula as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1758. Notice was received from the Mayor the appointment of Marilyn Foreman as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1759. Notice received from the Mayor the appointment of Esther Chung Weathers as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1760. Notice received from the Mayor the appointment of Lisa Hyde as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1761. Notice was received, was received from the Mayor the appointment of Carlos Stovall as a member of the Participatory Budget External Oversight Board for a term expiring November 15, 2025. Docket number 1762. Notice was received from me on the appointment of Martha Walls as a member of the Boston School Committee nominating panel. Docket number 1763. Notice was received from the mayor the appointment of Kay Solzman as a member of the Archives and Records Advisory Committee. Docket number 1764. Communication was received from the city clerk of the filing by the Boston Planning and Development Agency regarding the report and decision application on 150. 
Center Street Chapter 121A Project, Docket Number 1765. Notice was received from the City Clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the Mayor on papers acted upon by the City Council at its meeting of November 1st, 2023. Docket number 1766. Notice we received from the City Clerk in accordance of Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 relative to action taken by the Mayor on papers acted upon by the City Council at its meeting of November 15, 2023. Docket number 1767. Notice we received from the Mayor of her absence from the City from Thursday, November 16, 2023 at 7.30 a.m. returning Friday, November 17. 2023 at 5:30 p.m. Docket number 1768. Notice was received from the count from Council President Flynn of his absence from the city due to his attendance at the National League of Cities conference. And docket number 1769. Com communication was received from Councilor Ed Flynn regarding his vote on docket number 1368. And thank you. These dockets 1752 through 1769. They'll be placed on file. We're on to matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, could you please read docket 1722, please? Docket number 1722, order for a hearing to discuss a guaranteed basic income program for families living below the poverty line in the city of Boston. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson, the chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'll sit if you don't mind. Um, on Monday, November 27th, the committee held a hearing on docket 171722 um, to discuss a guaranteed basic income, um, or uh, as, as uh, <coughs> they, you know it by GBI in program for families living below the poverty line in the city of Boston. We held, um, a uh, hearing and heard from Shagun Idawu, Chief of Economic Opportunity, Economic Opportunity and Inclusion um, Cabinet, and Elijah Miller, Director of Policy of OEOI. Um, they explained that they were exploring the possibility of implementing a program which would provide payments to low-income families in the city of Boston as supplemental income. Uh, mirroring similar initiatives by other municipalities across the country, um, but that they were not prepared to uh, deliver a report of how far they've gotten in their research. Um, we, are, we were also joined by Jessica Ridge, Partnership Director at Up Together, Josh Waxman, Chief Operating Officer at Cot Camp Harborview, uh, Michael Charlotte, Chief of Staff, for Mayor um, Symbol Siddiqui of the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Allison Croner Barron, Rise Up Research Program Manager for Cambridge Community Foundation. They spoke on their current efforts on this matter and described that um, they've had success. They also discussed how GBI measures um, have been proven to help stabilize income low-income families and boost economic empowerment. Um, I would like to thank um, the lead co-sponsor, uh, the lead sponsor on this, um, Councillor Kendra Lara, for sponsoring this docket and defer to her to speak more on this matter. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Council Lara. Council Lara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to Councillor Anderson, the Chair of the Committee on Ways and Means, and to all my council colleagues who attended this hearing with us on a guaranteed basic income pilot in the city of Boston. Um, what we got, when what we saw, was really the beginnings uh, here on the City Council of a conversation that's been ongoing between my office and the administration for at least the last year. Uh, the City of Boston is in no way prepared to move forward with a GBI um, pilot, not at least at the moment, but I was encouraged 
encouraged by the administration's commitment to continue really looking at a wraparound approach to poverty in the city of Boston. My hope is that this will continue the, con continue the conversation, not just here on the council, but with the administration, and that soon in the coming year, we will see a proposal for a guaranteed basic income here in the city of Boston. I know that I've said this before, and I said this at the hearing, but in a city that is so incredibly wealthy, the bottom 20% of our residents are living off of only $14,000 a year of income. We have um, a poverty rate that is about 18% in the city, and our childhood poverty rate is almost at 30% uh, here in the city of Boston. We know that poverty is a policy failure, as we have seen so many times, that requires a policy solution. And since 1967, when Dr. King presented the idea of a universal basic income, all the way until now, where hundreds of cities, countries, and and um, municipalities in every single continent have really implemented a guaranteed basic income pilot. We've seen this idea blossom as something that can really help us pull families and children out of poverty like we've seen with the child tax credit uh, right after the pandemic. I think that as a council and as a city, we have a responsibility to ensure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable residents. And I'm really grateful to Councillor Anderson, the rest of the council and the administration for all of the work that they've done with my office in the last year to make sure that we see this program uh, come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. This docket 1722 will remain in committee. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1384? Docket number 1384, an ordinance establishing street food enterprises in the city of Boston municipal code by inserting Chapter 17, Section 22, Permitting and Regulation of Non-Motorized Street Food Carts. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo, the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Vice Chair, uh, Council Louis Jen uh, presided over that hearing, so I defer to her for the committee report. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. The Chair recognizes Council Louis Jen. Council Louis Jen, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, the Committee on Government Operations held a hearing yesterday on docket number 1384, an ordinance establishing street food enterprises in the city of Boston Municipal Code by inserted in, inserting chapter 17, section 22, permitting and regulation of non-motorized street food carts. This matter was referred to the committee on August 30th, uh, 2023, and sponsored by Councilors Gabriela Coletta, Julia Mejia, and Brian Morrell. This ordinance seeks to address the challenges faced by Boston street food vendors uh, by introducing regulations and a permitting process for non-motorized street food carts. Drawing inspiration from successful models in cities like DC, LA, New York, um, it proposes the creation of a non-motorized street food carts committee with defined responsibilities. The ordinance also aims to simplify the permitting process, reduce costs, and prevent unnecessary penalties for residents pursuing culinary businesses. It establishes rules for sidewalk vending, outlines permit fees, and, detail, and details enforcement measures. The overarching goal is to create more opportunities for entrepreneurs, enhance cultural food accessibility, and contribute to economic mobility in the city, especially for our low-income residents. In attendance from the administration was Yasha Franklin Hodge, Chief of Streets, Alicia Persena, Director of Small Businesses, Hans Bastien, Senior Business Manager of the Office of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion, Daniel Pendergrass, Assistant Commissioner at ISD, Korean, uh, Korean Reynolds, Director of Nightlife <coughs> Economy, and Kristen McCosh, Commissioner of the Disabilities Commission. It's a really robust uh, attendance by the administration um, and they expressed a lot of support for this idea. Councilors in attendance was the lead sponsor, uh, Councilor Gabriela Coletta, Councilor uh, Julia Mejia, Councilor Aunt Brian Morrell, District Two Council and Council President, uh, President Ed Flynn, Councilor Larger and Murphy, and myself presiding as Vice Chair. Administration officials indicated that the proposed that the uh, that this proposal provides an opportunity to use city government and for city departments to coordinate and collaborate to address the unmet needs of this growing group of vendors to create an equitable program. Administration officials describe the current process for non-motorized food push carts, which includes an application fee, um, permits, and explain that it can be confusing that this ordinance provides a mechanism, um, that it can be confusing, and that uh, one of the good things that this ordinance provides a mechanism to streamline the process. The committee discussed uh, that this industry provides an opportunity for individuals to build generational wealth and provide economic mobility. 
And we also discussed the uh, current ordinance on food trucks as a model. The committee discussed technical assistance for vendors and locations for these vendors. And just want to thank my colleagues for asking really great, succinct questions. Um, I want to thank the creativity of the lead sponsor, of the lead sponsor, Councillor Coletta. Uh, the committee will hold a working session to gather input from the business community and to work on specific language with the administration. To the chair, um, I will now turn it over to the lead uh, sponsor for any additional comments. The, the chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and, and thank you, uh, Chair and Vice Chair, and everybody that uh, showed up to the hearing and asked amazing questions. You gave a wonderful synopsis of what the conversation was like. Um, I do think that I, um, I well, I don't think, I, I know that I'm extraordinarily pleased at the administration's uh, response to this and seeing that it is in, an opportunity to unlock an economic mobility tool for entrepreneurs across the city. Um, we did discuss expediting the process and creating a passport program for applicants, technical assistance, um, apparatuses, creating an oversight committee, and increasing staff capacity. Externally, it was uh, mentioned many times that it is imperative that we develop specialized zones uh, and regulations for vendors in partnership with the community, really bringing everybody in, um, bringing merchants together, community leaders to discuss where these zones might be and using the food truck ordinance as a model. Um, again, I'm encouraged by uh, the administration's commitment to work through language and what I do, um, what I hope to do in the coming year is refile this with amended language um, and make sure that we have robust hearings with vendors at the table, um, community leaders and merchants just to provide the best uh, policy moving forward. So thank you so much and I appreciate everybody's work on this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Carter. This talk at 1384 will remain in committee. We're on to motions, orders, <coughs> resolutions. Mr. Quirk, can you please read docket 1770, please? Docket number 1770, Councilor Worrell offered the following. Petition for a special law relative to an act directing the City of Boston Police Department to waive the maximum age requirement for police officers for New Year's debate. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. And we've passed um, some of these waivers before in the past. I know Council um, Baker, Council Royal has done this, and myself has done this a few times. Uh, but just a little information about Newis. Uh, Newis's mom immigrated to the U.S. with him and his siblings in 1986. Uh, aside from a three-month stint living in Taunton, He's been a Boston resident ever since. Uh, he went to college at Mount Ida, earned a degree in criminal justice, and at the age of 19, he became a father. Uh, but bat burning in his career and education as he helped care for his new child. Uh, some of brief description of his work history, he's worked for the Suffolk District Attorney's Office and the Sheriff's Office. He's also been a BPS school, school officer, and for the past 13 years, he's worked as an officer for DPH. Um, after applying uh, multiple times, to, BP, um, to the Boston Police Department. Uh, BPD has reapproached him this year and encouraged him to, uh, to reapply. So he's now he's ready to reapply, but now he needs a, um, an age waiver. So I'm looking to suspend and pass in this uh, to make sure that he's able to get part of the next class. Thank you. Thank you, Council Wuerl. Is anyone looking to speak on this matter? Is anyone looking, would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, would you please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baker, Councilor Braden, Councilor Coletta, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Councilor Dirk, and Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lara, Councilor Louis Jen, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, and please add the chair. <coughs> Council Worrell seeks suspension of the rules in passage of this docket 1770. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, can we uh, do a roll call vote? Roll call vote on docket number 1770. Councilor Arroyo? Yes. Councilor Arroyo, yes. Councilor Baker? Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Braden? Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta? Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Durkin? Yes. Councilor Durkin, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson? Council Fernandez Anderson, yes. Council Flaherty? Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn? Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara? Yes. Council Lara, yes. Council Lujan? Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia? Yes. 
Council Mejia, yes. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell? Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1770 has received a unanimous vote in the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Before docket 1771 is formally withdrawn, I do want to acknowledge Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you Thank have you. the floor. Thank you. Um, we, the Boston City Council, as we know, are tasked with the responsibility to review the way the city spends money and review all money that comes into the city, which we know um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, sent us $560 million to the city. So last year, the Boston's COVID-19 Recovery Committee was formed to offer oversight and recommendations on the city's distribution and implementation of all COVID-19 relief funding and programs. This, as we know, is a once in a generation opportunity for our city. So I did file this this week with um, Council President Flynn and I was going to suspend the rule and add Councilor Mejia, just for the record. Um, but it was brought to my attention that what then Chair, former Councilor Bach and Councilor Worrell had filed a similar um, hearing order that did stay in committee. So um, after speaking with Councilor Worrell and the current chair, Councilor Durkin, we are going to hold a meeting before this year and I do hope that this committee stays in the following term so that we can continue to oversight and make sure that we are spending the money properly and also ensuring that we're giving supports to many of the nonprofits and the contracts that were given out. This is a lot of money and we want to make sure that it is being spent and the city residents of the city of Boston are um, positively impacted by it. So thank you, Council President Flynn. I do formally withdraw this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Murphy. Docket 1771 is withdrawn. <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, could you please read docket 1772, please? Docket number 1772, Council Flynn offered the following. Order to amend the Boston City Council rules to include the Committee on the Prevention of Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Uh, the Chair recognizes Councilor Flynn. Councilor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Council Braden. This is an amendment to the Boston City Council rules to add a committee on the prevention of domestic violence and sexual assault. This would be a standalone committee that directly focuses on the issue of domestic violence and sexual assault, which would show the City Council's long-term commitment in addressing these critical public safety related issues. The issue of domestic violence and sexual assault unfortunately remain prevalent in our society. One in four women and one in nine men experience severe intimate partner physical violence. One in five women and one in 71 men in the country have been raped in their lifetime. 11% of high school students, 6% of middle, middle school students. Moreover, according to the National Domestic Violence Hotline, the presence of a gun in domestic violence situations increased the risk of homicide for women by 500%. This council has also recently shown that we have focused on gun violence, passing both an ordinance on the study of gun trafficking in the flow of illegal firearms in a resolution declaring gun violence a public health emergency. I want to say thank you to my council colleagues for their leadership on that, and especially Council World. In the past, I have sponsored and held a hearing at Northeastern University School of Law with then City Council President, now Massachusetts Attorney General Andrea Campbell, on this issue. We were able to hear the stories directly from survivors who shared their experience, along with organizations in this field. It was clear then, it's clear now, that they need more support and resources. I have worked with my City Council co colleagues on this issue and work with many outstanding nonprofits that raise awareness and help victims of domestic violence, including the Asian Task Force Against Domestic Violence in Casa Myrna. I'd also like to continue the work of my mother, Kathy Flynn, who 
who has worked to support victims of domestic violence during her term as First Lady of Boston. This goal of the committee would be supporting the survivors of domestic violence in sexual assault, crafting strategies for prevention, and offer reporting opportunities for all communities. It will work with organizations and stakeholders to bring awareness to the public and advocate for survivors, especially those in our communities of color, our LGBTQ+, plus, our immigrant communities, expanding language and communication access to immigrant communities related to this issue as well. These are difficult conversations, but just in the last several days, some domestic violence organizations have already reached out to me about this committee, offered positive feedback, and expressed that they would want to be part of this work, be part of this ongoing work. I would also like to note that many of our committees currently overlap, and past city council presidents have also added council committees that are targeted towards specific issues during their terms, including President, President O'Malley adding a committee on APA funds, President Linehan adding a committee on the 2024 Olympics. I, re I realize that this is late in our city council term, but I also believe it's a critical issue. It's important to show that this issue has the, is a top priority for members of the city council, and I know it already is, and I would like to continue to work on this serious issue going forward. My goal and my hope is that we can suspend and pass this today. Thank you, Councilor Braden. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Lynn for bringing this forward. I hope we do pass this today. I just also want to highlight seniors. You hear oftentimes that seniors suffer domestic violence from children that may live in the home. So there's lots of um, residents that are suffering out there and it's important that we do target specifically. And there are overlaps as the chair of public health. I know it could come into my committee. It could come into Council of Flaherty's Committee of Public Safety or your committee councilor. Um, right in on like strong women and families. So making sure that we're targeting and putting the resources and having direct conversations to help ease the pain that many suffer. So thank you, Council President. Um, Councilor um, Fernandez-Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Council Braden. Uh, Councilor President Flynn, just clarifying questions. Um, the domestic violence is definitely under public health and we know that sometimes it's a mental health focus or public health focus or resources and social service focus. Um, I guess the only trouble that I have with that is when we start you know, to um, hyper-focus on specific issues, then how many committees will we have? I'm actually of the opinion that we should decrease the amount of committees that exist. Um, could you clarify for us or for me um, specifically how do you see that being um, more intuitive than than what it the setup now Councillor Flynn you have the floor thank you Council Braden and thank you Council Fernandez Anderson for the question I think the issue of domestic violence is <clears throat> is is a unique issue and deserves to have a standalone committee for the unique aspect and challenges of domestic violence and survivors. As, as, as was noted, it has some jurisdiction with public health. It has some jurisdiction with um, public safety and strong women and families. And when you have, in my opinion anyway, but when you have three committees that kind of are responsible for domestic violence, it doesn't get the priority. It doesn't get the priority that it, it needs and deserves. And I think having a standalone committee on domestic violence will be a clear message to, to the city, but to survivors that Boston City Council takes this issue very seriously. And I'm not saying we don't now, because we do. But having a standalone committee on domestic violence meeting frequently, regularly, bringing in 
various organizations such as Casa Myrna or the Asian Task Force Against Domestic, Domestic Violence and Public Safety and Mental Health Counselors, Public Safety, um, Public Health rather. I think it will ensure that resources are coordinated in a structured way and people can know, people will know that this committee has the resources, has the information to educate the public on this critical issue. And that's what I hope to do is coordinate some of those strategies into this one committee, not saying I'm going to be the chairman because it's likely I, I will not be the chairman, um, but I just want to set it up where whoever becomes chairman in the next term has the ability to focus specifically on domestic violence related issues because it's it's a top priority it's a major problem in this city in this state in this country thank you councillor flynn um councillor Mahir, you have the floor thank you madam chair and thank you to uh, president flynn for bringing this to the council i'm curious as we talk about committees i know this is not the I'm not rising to speak specifically about the committee that you're presenting, but it really gives us an opportunity to really think about how committees are even assigned. I think that, uh, you know, traditionally it is negotiating behind the scenes, and that's you get what you get and you don't get upset. Um, but I think that that's not the way we should be doing business here in the city of Boston. I think that if there's going to be committees, it should be based on your, um, your skill set, your you know, to have some sense of understanding why you are uh, being elected to chair that committee. I think that, you know, especially when we're talking about domestic violence or things of that nature, um, there, there should be a level of standard in how we're going to move forward. So I think that that should also be a part of the conversation since you're introducing one. I think that we should, before your time is over, really think about how we as a council um, we'll be working collectively and collaboratively um, in our next two years because just assigning um, committees to people based on politics is just not a really good practice and one that I don't want to be a part of. So I just wanted to note that for the record. Thank you, Councillor Mejia. Um, Councillor Mejia, I, I agree with you. I think your points are, are, are well taken and I think the transparency is a critical part of developing committees, working to see who the next chairs are of various committees and making sure that our colleagues are successful when they are appointed to a, a chair, a committee, or, or a vice chair. And so I, I, I thank you, Council Mejia, and I, j I just want to close, I guess, with one, one final statement. In, in my six years as a city councilor, the best hearing I've ever been involved with is working with Councilor Andrea Campbell at this city council meeting that was held off-site at Northeastern University. And it's, a, it's an issue that hasn't received the proper um, attention at times. I don't recall many other domestic violence committee hearings in the council over, over the last five or six years. Not to, not to blame anybody, but I think if you had one person that is the chair of that committee, that chair would be able to focus solely on domestic violence, sexual assault. So I think <clears throat> that's one of my final points that I, I wanted to make to the board. But I, I do hope we, we are able to uh, suspend and pass and it is not about me. I do not intend to be the chair of this committee. Um, I think there's other people that do tremendous work in this field. So I just want to let people know it, it's not about me and it's not about um, me becoming the chair of the, of the committee. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Councillor Braden. Um, Councillor President Flynn, I think um, I will probably be voting president. Um, only because I feel like I need more time to think about it. And um, if we start doing that, if we start taking things in pieces, then I, for me it's counterintuitive um, to make it smaller and smaller and smaller um, and more committees. And then the other piece that we're t talking about, so three points, that's one. Secondly, I would say that um, politically and optically, 
this is a, it's a, you know what I mean? It's putting someone against the wall. Um, as politicians, this is televised and people are watching. When you say domestic violence and if people say no, then they optically look like they may appear as though they don't support it. So for the record, I think that folks, even if they vote no today or present, um, for me personally, it's not that of course I don't support it. I used to, I'm a certified men um, mental health counselor and did a lot of work with uh, domestic violence. Um, and some of us here have people that have experienced it or experienced it ourselves, so, um, or friends. Um, and so I think that the other, the third, the third um, point that I wanted to touch on is that if we're going to talk about committees or how they are signed, then file to change the rules or figure it out. Let's not file things to set precedents on how we create committees, or let's not let's not dance, you know, beat around the bush and dance around the the the, the, the elephant here. That's a new term. Um, and so I would say, if we're going to talk about it, let's let's just talk about it because last time, when my first our first term, right, when um, we got the committees that we wanted and we felt like we won, no one was complaining. There was no just addition and subtraction stuff. So let's just say that um, maybe we don't get the committees that you, you want or that we want, or some will, some won't. But either way, fair is fair. This wasn't the process last time. Let's not change it this time. When you were, when, when, um, you, when you have, you've been president for the, this term and um, none of this stuff was taking place. So I just feel like it's a little odd. So for me, I will refrain and I will not um, be voting. I'll be voting present. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, I beg you, I think Councillor Coletta, you're next. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering if the clerk uh, can possibly read the current description in the rules of the Committee on Strong Women, Families and Communities. Thank you. The Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities, which shall concern itself with stabilizing communities within particular focus, with a particular focus on girls and women. The committee will concern itself with the equitable delivery of human services and city programming for youth, families, and seniors. The committee shall work to encourage nonprofit youth agencies to work with the city to help youth develop into productive and healthy adults. The committee shall concern itself with issues related to the youth, including but not limited to summer jobs, youth activities, volunteerism, and youth violence. The committee shall have oversight with respect to Boston Centers for Youth and Families, the Boston Youth Fund, the Women's Commission, and the Age Strong Commission. Thank you. There's no mention of domestic violence or sexual harassment in, in that committee. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Councillor Coletta. Anyone else wish to speak? I think as the chair of Strong Women and Families, um, I'd like to... I was a newly elected uh, city councillor in 2020 when we had COVID hit 10 weeks after, after we were sworn in. And one of the hearings that I sponsored at that early stage in the COVID pandemic was uh, a hearing on the impacts of... Uh, the COVID epidemic on mental health and uh, we had a hearing, a very robust and very long hearing that went on for three and a half hours, I think, about the impacts of, on mental health and we had Casa Myrna and other organisations working on domestic. One of the biggest concerns going into at that stage in early 2020 was the impacts of uh, remote learning and uh, working from home and all the pressures it was going to put on families uh, and there was very real concerns about an increase in domestic violence so we had we have had a hearing on domestic violence in the context of uh, the COVID epidemic and I think as the chair of um, you know strong women and families I think it'd be worth doing a forensic retrospective and, and bringing in uh, Casa Myrna and other organizations that work on domestic violence to um, you know establish what exactly what was the extent of the damage and what was the the extent of uh, the uptick in in domestic violence it, it is 
Uh, we anecdotally we know, but we uh, you know it'd be nice to get some metrics on that. Uh, I also feel that you know I really respect uh, Councillor Flynn's um, advocacy on this issue, um, but I think we have the mechanism within our city council structure right now with our with our existing committees, the Committee on Public Health, Homeless is Homelessness and Recovery has a specific language that says that um, that domestic and sexual violence, sexual harassment, sexual harassment, child abuse and neglect, reproductive health, LGBTQ health, mentoring, trauma, hunger, human trafficking, and social, uh, social inequities in health are all under the remit of an existing committee. So it begs the question, do we need another committee that would uh, sort of take, take the sexual assault and domestic violence piece out of, out of the public health space. Um, so it's, it's just a question. I, 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 I don't know, Councillor Flynn, would you like to answer, uh, respond to that question? Thank you, Councillor Braden. I think it's a fair question and it's an important piece to discuss is, you know, what, what is the relevant committee? What is the, what, what committee should domestic violence go into? You know, some might advocate public safety, some might advocate public health. Um, strong woman and family, but I guess that's exactly the point is there's so many different committees that could coordinate domestic violence hearings in, 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 on the council. And that's why having a designated standalone committee to deal with domestic violence will bring this important issue to a place of um, higher, higher focus on, on behalf of our colleagues. As I, as I said, um, people voting no against this, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't take it personally, and I know you're still committed to supporting survivors and doing everything you, you possibly can, so I respect your position, even if you vote, uh, vote against it, and it's no reflection on your commitment to supporting those with domestic violence. But, but, I, but my point is when so many people, so many committees have a little bit of a jurisdiction over one particular subject, that almost means no one has jurisdiction over it and it's not the priority that it should be. And I think elevating this issue even higher um, on the city council will, will help survivors of domestic violence in knowing knowing what services are available, available to them. One of the first meetings I had six years ago, when I, when I started as a city councilor, I met with the director of the Asian Task Force Against Domestic Violence, and I, I, I asked her, I said, what is your number one concern as the, as the executive director? And she told me language access, because this is a high, this is a major problem in the Asian community. But as you know, in the Asian community, there's many different languages that are spoken, um, along with immigration challenges. Many survivors of domestic violence, regard, depending on their immigration status, think that if they go forward to the police, that it could impact their immigration status, which it, which it won't, thankfully. But, but there's a lot of those issues that could be, if we had this one committee, we could coordinate with language and communication access. We could coordinate with the, uh, with public health. We could coordinate, Council Braden and myself had a conversation two days ago about the Family Justice Center on Commonwealth Avenue. I've been there for several tours and would like to host a tour there um, with my colleagues sometime next year but it's coordinating those critical services under one designated standalone committee that has the authority to act specifically and only on domestic violence, sexual assault. So again, really want to ask my colleagues if they would, if they would support this. I think it will be great for the residents. It will be helpful to survivors. And um, just want to ask for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, Councillor um, 
Councillor Durkin and then Councillor Murphy. Thank you so much, um, Councillor Braden, and thank you so much, Council President Flynn. I know this issue of domestic violence is really important to many of us, um, but given that we are less than a month from the end of the term, and given that um, the committees will be dissolved as of January 1 at our first meeting, um, I don't think it is the right time to, um, but I think it's an important conversation that we're having on the council floor about where, where this issue will live in the next term. Um, so I appreciate the beginning of this conversation, uh, but I'll be voting no just because as a new counselor who has been, um, who is a little over four months into my term, I know that if we, um, you know, I've been seeing the clock tick down with the committees that I am getting to chair um, and, the, and the clock tick down in terms of what hearings we are able to schedule before the end of the year. So if we were to um, get this committee up and running and give it a chair, uh, that person would have to think of, um, you know, someone would have to think of something to file and for us to be able to go from starting up a committee to there being a first hearing before the end of the year, it seems pretty impossible to me. Um, but I think this conversation is incredibly important and it's something that we should take into account for the new year, given um, uh, Councillor Coletta's comment and question about where does this live, given that it doesn't have a formal home, creating a formal home in January I think is really important, but I'll be voting no because I think a change this late in the game uh, may not really have any impact. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dragon. Um, Councillor Flynn, you wish to respond? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Braden. I understand your concern. Um, I, I, I would just highlight that it's never too late to establish a committee, a committee of importance. As I mentioned, several other committees were established due to um, the importance of a certain issue impacting, impacting Boston. Um, but I, I don't envision that this committee would have a hearing by the end of the year. But I, I would want this committee to be in place so going forward there's a standalone committee that colleagues can have the opportunity to study over the, over the holidays and learn more about what committees they would like to um, think about. And I think this would be a, a perfect opportunity for someone to establish themselves as kind of a leader in this field, but also providing critical services to, to, to residents, to survivors. But I, I, I don't envision anyone that is, is selected as chair that would, would call for hearing. That's, that's not what, I'm, what I want to do. But I, I do want to ensure that I, I'm doing my very best up until the last second um, I'm city council president and I'm not letting any time go by um, and sitting, sitting by while these critical issues um, are not addressed. And that's, that's why I'm bringing this forward today. It's an important issue. It's an issue I've worked on with my colleagues in the city council, and I think it needs to be elevated. And let's be honest, we haven't had a, he a hearing on domestic violence in a, in a long time. And myself included, we could have called a hearing on domestic violence. I'm not blaming anybody, but let's let's move forward. Let's have a standalone designated committee, so we can elevate this issue. I, it's it's a critical issue, and I think if we vote yes on it, and when we go into the holidays and, and into January, we will have made the right decision to have a standalone domestic violence committee. I think. Thank I think you. You, you you're making the right decision if you vote yes, and. We're going to be helping a lot of people. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Murphy, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak again. Um, and I do appreciate all my colleagues who have spoken. And this back and forth, I think, is important for us to have. And as the chair of the um, Public Health Committee, it's not just public health, right? It's public health, mental health, homelessness, recovery, and lots of things and this time around it's still the pandemic mass and cast mental health issues which was my maiden speech which was yours directed towards employees was mine directed more towards students across the city of boston also homeless shelters um, 
community health centers, migrants, I mean, the list goes on and on. And um, Councillor Coletta, you did ask about the you know, official definition of your committee, and the first description is under public health about domestic and sexual violence, but also select sexual harassment, child abuse, like maybe um, those also could be put into this committee. It's a sensitive topic. I do agree that um, you know, we could go back and forth, do we want more committees or less, but meetings and having someone committed to having that on their mind and making sure they're advocating and keeping um, connections, right? Because as a committee chair, it is all about making relationships to different city departments that would um, be connected to that committee, but also nonprofits and residents across the city. So um, when it comes to a vote, I will be voting in favor of it. But thank you for the conversation, everyone. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, Councillor louis -Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Braden. And I just, uh, not to, uh, not to be repetitive, I think the statements that you made and I think the statements that Councillor Durkin made are really uh, spot on when it comes to the timing of have this filing and whether the efficacy of having this filing at this time when there are only two meetings left after this, there's a limited calendar, and when there's substantial overlap. Like Councillor Murphy just stated, in the very first, in the second sentence on the definition of Committee on Public Health, Homelessness and Recovery, is uh, the committee shall concern itself with domestic and sexual violence. So it falls under one committee. There are so many issues. We just had, for example, the first message in order of the day was one on uh, housing discrimination. That is an order, that is a message in order that could have gone to the Civil Rights Committee because the Office of Fair Housing and Equity sits under uh, the equity cabinet, not with Sheila Dillon, not with the Office of Housing with Chief Dillon, but we make the decision sometimes, strikes and balls, of where you're putting something in committee, even though there are a number of committees where something is applicable. I think if someone has a filing on domestic violence, there are the Public Health Committee, the Strong Women and Families Committee, there are a number of areas where this, um, where it can fit. And I think, you know, for a number of reasons as a, as a body that is majority of women and women being more susceptible to issues of domestic violence and sexual assault, it's one that we care about deeply. Um, in the month of March for International Women's Month, I honored specifically and solely organizations that are addressing issues of domestic violence. That's Casa Mirna, that's AFAB, uh, Association of Patient Women in Boston, that's uh, Shakira's story. Shakira Robinson has a powerful story, has her own consulting business on domestic violence. Um, that's Centro Presente and Patricia Montes and the work that she's doing there. Well, we have not had a hearing specifically on domestic violence. We did have a hearing regarding the needs of our immigrant communities, and Patricia Montes was there. And she spoke to Centro Presente and the work that they're doing, gen uh, gender-based violence, and I wish more of my colleagues, if they were there, would have heard about the work that she talked about. Uh, when it comes to the issues of domestic violence and gender-based violence that our women face, specifically the uh, groups that uh, Count, uh, President Flynn talked about, communities of color uh, and, and our immigrant communities who are more susceptible to domestic violence. In the month of October, I presented a resolution recognizing October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month here on the council because of how important of an issue it is to me and how I talked about how when I was a... Uh, when I was young, I had to intervene in a very difficult domestic violence situation in my own family. And so uh, I think there are lots, we haven't had a hearing on it. It's something that I've been working on with Rasan Hall over at the Urban League. They have a phenomenal program that working with black and brown communities about domestic violence. One of the issues is that we don't talk about enough. And so I am all for talking about it as much as we possibly can. When we look at the gun violence pandemic around the country, when you look at mass shootings, at the root of it is often a domestic violence situation. So I think we care about this issue and there are lots of places where it can land. I think we've, 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 uh, there have been ways in which we've, uh, we've talked about it. Margot Lindauer at Northeastern is doing incredible work, a good friend of mine. There are so many ways that we can continue to talk about this issue. Uh, Councilor Fernand Janison made good points about you know, the, the number of committees that we have, and I think that there are ways for us to really do this work that folks before us, starting from Councilor Anna Presley, to uh, now Congresswoman, to folks here now care deeply about this issue. I, I'm not even gonna, you know, myself, other people here who have been victims of sexual assault care about these issues. We're just, you know, as a matter of process and what's the best way to do this, 
this is not the best way to do it, so I will also be voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Louis-Jean. Councillor Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you. I think my colleagues have made uh, good points, but I, my question is actually for the clerk. Uh, this would be a rule change, correct? Not a, yes. not a standard vote, so it needs two-thirds? Two-thirds. Thank you. Um, Councillor Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, <clears throat> just a question to Council President Flynn. With so many um, of our colleagues have so many questions and, you know, look into the process. Would you consider um, taking this to a hearing to discuss more so we can all discuss as a group whether it's, you know, more committees, less committees, strengthening language in a committee to kind of prioritize what you're looking to achieve here um, with this resolution? Um, would you consider having a hearing on this, Council President Flynn? Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. I don't know if we, I don't know if a hearing is necessary. I think this is a hearing in a way where everybody's input is heard. Everybody is, is here. Everybody is voicing their opinion one way or the other. And they're doing it in a respectful environment, in a, in a respectful manner. I've never been to a hearing where we've had this large number of colleagues in a city council hearing. Um, so, you know, ge generally I have a hearing and, you know, sometimes there's two or three people there. Um, so I'm not, I'm not here to criticize my, my colleagues, um, and I know you're going to be voting no on this, um, but I just wanted to follow up on Council Louis Jean. It's, I, I made, I, I was pretty clear that anyone that voted no, um, I'm not taking it personally. It's it's not about me. It's not about um, what I, what I want to do. It's about supporting the survivors. And I and I made that clear that people that vote against this are not um, you know shouldn't be criticized. So I'm not I'm not sure, um, Council Louis Jean, why it was necessary to engage engage me as if. I'm, I'm being critical of people that are in opposition to my proposal because I'm not. I made that clear. I just think that this issue should be elevated, and that's why I'm here. I'm, that's why I'm doing it. You, we can vote it, vote against it, and maybe the next city council president will add it Thank onto you. the onto the um, <clears throat> onto the next committee. But could, pardon. Um, thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Flynn. Um, Councillor Fernandez Anderson, I would like to wind up this conversation fairly soon and bring this to a vote. So, uh, Councillor Fernandez, uh, Mr. Clerk, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. I appreciate, uh, Madam Councillor, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, Councillor Flaherty, you were saying? The point of order? Are you no, rushing me? No, you're not. Oh, my point of order. Um, I, if we're changing the rules, you, you filed it in a way that it's establishing something, but it's really changing the rules. And that's why I said, you know, I'd vote present, I'd want time to talk about it, I'd want a hearing. So the question is, like, if it's changing the rules, it's not really about establishing the committee since it's going to be dissolved. And we're not going to be able to address anything, any issues on domestic violence by January 1st. So this is just about changing the rules or setting precedents. Is it about setting precedents that we can create new committees, or is it about is it about the, the victims? I, I, I'm I'm just I'm just trying to figure out like if we're not going to have any hearings before then, and the the committee is going to be dissolved, it's up to the next president to figure that out or to establish new committees. Is it about changing the rules and setting precedents and saying look we did this last year, or is it about the victims? Because we're not going to do anything for the victims until January first. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor uh, Fernandez Anderson. Um, Councillor Flaherty moves to take to this to a vote. Um, Councillor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 1772. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can you um, take a roll call vote on this? Roll call vote on docket number 1772. Councillor Arroyo. Councillor Baker. Aye. Councillor Baker, aye. Councillor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta. Present. present. Councilor Coletta, present. Councilor Durkin. No. Councilor Durkin, no. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Present. 
Council Fernandez Anderson, present. Flaherty, Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Flaherty, yes. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. Council Lujan. No. Council Lujan, no. Council Mejia. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Murphy, yes. Councilor Worrell. Present. Councilor Worrell, present. Docket number 1772 has received five votes in the affirmative and two votes in the negative and three present votes. Does, does not pass. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, everyone, for a very um, robust and uh, respectful conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Brayden. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1773? Docket number 1773, Council Coletta offered the following. 17F order regarding funding related to Constitution Inn at the Charlestown Navy Yard. Thank you. Uh, the Chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, the 17F is filed in partnership with members of the Charlestown community and in, in the spirit of transparency. I specifically request in this 17F information regarding a project located at the Constitution Inn, as well as information on flood mitigation and coastal resilience efforts and payments made uh, for general uh, community mitigation. The Charlestown Navy Yard was decommissioned and conveyed to the then Boston Redevelopment Authority in 1974. Today, the BPDA owns and manages a number of unique assets in the Navy Yard and collects revenue from ground and commercial leases and licenses. Understanding the revenues being collected by the BPDA from within the Charlestown Navy Yard can help ensure an equal level of maintenance and investment is going back to this area and adequate mitigation investments from developers. Transparency around this information will help the Charlestown community and the City of Boston best navigate through development review processes in the neighborhood, uh, in this area of the neighborhood. And I um, humbly ask my colleagues for their support in passing this 17th. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Carter. Council Coletta seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this stock at 1773. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1774? Docket number 1774. Council Worrell offered the following resolution honoring Barbados's 57th Independence Day and flag raising. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. <coughs> Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. And um, my dad um, is from the island of Barbados, and if you haven't visited, I encourage you to make your way down to one of my favorite places to go to. Um, but November 30th marks the 57th anniversary of Barbados Independence Day. In Massachusetts, there are nearly 5,000 foreign-born Barbadians, with more than half residing in Boston. Uh, Barbados is the 15th largest country of origin among foreign-born residents, making up 1.5% of the city's total. The Barbadian community has greatly contributed to Boston's culture, society, and economy. From business to sports, politics to education, to dance to literature and the arts, they've become a vital part of Boston's diverse identity. Over half of the Barbadian population in Massachusetts resides in Boston. I want to um, invite all my colleagues in the city of Boston to join us uh, for our flag raising ceremony tomorrow at 11 a.m. Um, on City Hall Plaza, we honor Barbados um, and the impact that they have on our, our great city of Boston. Your presence will be an honor as we celebrate this milestone uh, together. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Worrell. Is anyone looking to speak on this matter? Oh, no. I'd like to suspend and pass. Okay. Thanks. Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Council Baker, Council Braden, Council Quarter, Council Durkin, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Eugene, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. Council will all seek suspension of the rules and passage of this docket 1774. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1775? Docket number 1775, Councilors Mejia and, or and Councilor Worrell offered the following. Resolution recognizing November 20th through December 20th, 2023 as National Survivors of Homicide Awareness Month.
Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The United States faces a national public health crisis of gun violence. Um, actually, before I start, I'd like to suspend um, and add Councilor Rural as an original co-sponsor, right? You have been added and everything's called your name. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, on an average, more than 13,000 homicides each year continue to rob families and communities of their loved ones. Homicide increased by 30% in 2020, compounding the many deaths caused by COVID-19. Reports of, um, from the FBI show that U.S. homicide rates have come down from its pandemic peak. However, in 2022, rate um, remained above pre-pandemic levels. For um, every one homicide victim, there are at least 10 surviving family members, resulting in an average of 13, uh, 130,000 new survivors of homicide victims each year. Surviving family members uh, need holistic, coordinated, compassionate, and consistent support and services in the immediate aftermath of a homicide and ongoing opportunities for healing in the months and years afterwards. Nevertheless, surviving family members want to remember and honor their loved ones, um, regardless of the circumstances surrounding their death, and it is important, important that we honor them too. I'm asking that we suspend the rules and pass this resolution, recognizing November 20th, 20th um, to December 20th, 2023, as National Survivor of Homicide Awareness Month, that the Boston City Council expresses its support um, for the destination of a National Survivors of Homicide Awareness Month on the federal level in order to raise awareness of survivors of homicide, support um, survivors of homicide victims, including families, schools, and communities with support services and information. Um, so I like to just go freestyle here real quick. Um, so in 1993, my neighbor, Louis D. Brown, um, or 1992, I can't keep up with these years, but um, was murdered. Um, and Tina Cherry, as a result of, of losing her son, um, turned her pain into purpose um, and created the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute. In 1996, I hosted a citywide violence prevention conference in which Tina was the uh, keynote speaker. And here we are in 2023, and the work that the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute has done to create space for people to heal um, and to support each other through their most you know, tragic times really speaks to the fact that we have this idea that people are just gonna get over the, the loss of their loved ones, but the long-term impact, you know, especially with the holidays coming around the corner, um, that you don't have that loved one there, it's why this, uh, recognizing this month in particular is so important because it's in, during these um, moments that we realize that empty chair. And so I just want to uh, uplift Tina Cherry for her work and the countless families that she has supported um, through their journey in healing because it is not easy to forgive someone who has done you wrong. Um, but that is part of your healing and your trauma. And so I just want to uplift um, Tina and her team for their lifetime commitment to, to this work here in the city of Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. I also want to thank you know, Council Mejia for adding me to this docket as original co-sponsor. I also want to thank um, all the nonprofits and individuals who showed up to the State House, I believe it was last week, uh, who constantly uh, work with our survivors um, we Are Better Together, Louis D. Brown Peace Institute, uh, Dee Dee's Cry, uh, Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence, MGH, and also um, Rock, redefining um, our community, the, the Odom family. I also want to thank my colleagues um, for their work around gun violence, um, and also the, the, the uh, ordinance that we passed, Council President Flynn, um, around um, gun, gun tracking. Uh, trauma takes various forms, and unfortunately, I've, I've witnessed the loss of too many lives to gun violence, a pervasive issue in our city, my district, and the neighborhood where I grew up. Every community deserves safety, um, necessitating the significant investments in research and education. We must pinpoint the most underserved communities and channel resources with intelligent, strategic plans that prioritize the dignity and healing of survivors. 
A dedicated response to homicide, similar to our government's approach to COVID-19 pandemic, is imperative. When a loved one is lost to homicide, the trauma persists for a lifetime. Neighborhoods are not only marked by the act by itself, but also by its aftermath and response. Fortunately, resources for addressing the aftermath now exist. Amplified by the Lucy Brown Peace Institute, we need more institutes like this to guide our journey to recovery. The Peace Institute was established to the end um, the victimization of survivors of homicides, victims, and confront the systemic failures perpetuating violent cycles. Our ultimate aim is for fewer homicides, aspiring for a safer and more peaceful community for all. But we must not forget those left behind and those acts of violence. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Baker, Council Braden, Council Coletta, Council Dirk, and Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Flaherty, Council Louis Jean, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. Council Mejia and Council were all seek suspension of the rules in passage of this docket 1775. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has been adopted. We're on to we're on to personnel orders. Mr. Clerk, can you please read docket 1776? Docket number 1776, Council of Flint for Council of The Chair seeks suspension of the rules and passes of this docket 1776. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 1777. Docket number 1777, Council of Flint for Council of The Chair of seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this docket 1777. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. We're on to late files. Okay. I have been informed by the clerk that there are three late file matters. Two of them are personnel orders. Okay. And the other is a, a report from the Ways and Means Committee. Um, Mr. Clerk, can we, um, can we take a roll call vote to add these late file matters into the agenda? Or a voice vote? Voice vote. Yeah, we'll do a voice vote. Um, all those in favor of adding these late file matters into the agenda, please say aye. Opposed say nay, the ayes have it. These late file matters have been added to the agenda. Mr. Clerk, can we do the first two late file matters, which are the personnel orders? First uh, late file uh, personnel order, Council of Flint for Council of Baker. The chair seeks suspension of the rules and passage of this late file personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay, the ayes have it. This docket, this late file matter has been passed. Mr. Clerk, the second personnel order. Second personnel order, Council of Flint for Council of Bates. She has seek suspension of the rules and passage of this late file matter, personnel order. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This late file matter has passed. Okay. And, it, and it, the final one is an order from Council of Tanya Fernandez Anderson. Offered by Council of Tanya Fernandez Anderson, an order relative to the adoption of classification in the city of Boston in fiscal year 2024. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. Uh, this order is uh, one that the council sees every year, uh, just part of the tax rate classification process. Um, it addresses two matters, the difference in tax rates between residential and commercial properties and the maximum savings allowed by residential tax exemption. Historically, the city has approved a breakdown that puts the lowest amount of tax burden on residential taxpayers um, and allows them the maximum amount of savings with the residential tax exemption, which is 35% um, of the um, assessed value. This order aims to uphold that tradition, um, and that's, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Uh, sorry, Mr. President. Uh, yeah, uh, the chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Just wanted to go on record that um, I actually have um, a medical thing, 
and will not be around um, to hold a hearing, but my um, the uh, Vice Chair of Ways and Means, uh, Council Rural, will be hosting a hearing. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone like to speak in this matter? Would anyone like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Braden, Councillor Coletta, Councillor Durkin, Councillor Louisian, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Worrell. This this matter will be referred to the to the Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Clerk, we're on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to pull from the green sheets may do so at this time. The chair recognizes Councilor Braden, then I'll go to Councilor Baker, and then. Thank you, Mr. President. Yep. Um, the green sheets um, for Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. Uh, I have. I have. Oh, where's my. If I have three, um, I have two dockets, sorry. Mr. Clerk, I'd like to call dockets 1435 and 1512 on page 19 and 20 of the green sheets for the Committee on Strong Women and Families. Mr. Clerk, on dockets 1512, 1435, can we read those into the record and then poll the committee to ensure that they're properly before the body? From the Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities, docket number 1435, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1,620,752 in the form of a grant for the State Fiscal 24 Council on Aging Formula Allocation, awarded by the Mass Executive Office of Elder Affairs to be administered by the Age Strong Commission. The grant will fund social and health care services for 115,768 older adults in the city of Boston at $14 per person, according to the 2020 census data from UMass Boston Donahue Institute. And docket number 1512, message in order authorizing the city of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $1 million in the form of a grant Administration for Children and Families, awarded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to be administered by the Office of Early Childhood. The grant will fund child care for homeless children and to provide training to providers offering those these services. M Mr. Clerk, we're going to poll the committee. Poll the committee, yes. Okay. The Committee on Strong Women, Families, and Communities. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Mejia. Councilor Lara. And Co Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Mr. Clark. That vote was for both dockets. The chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, at this time, I recommend the passage of dockets 1435 and 1512 so the funds can be immediately expended by the Age Strong Commission and the Office for Early Childhood to support seniors and youth through the winter season ahead. I think uh, both dockets are uh, fairly self explanatory. Uh, the, uh, the funds that will go to the Age Strong Commission will provide social and health care services for. 115,768 older adults in the city. Uh, and the second docket uh, will be targeted as a million dollars at the Office of Early Childhood to fund childcare for unhoused children and to bolster the capacity of and capacity building through training of more service providers in this uh, much needed area. Uh, so I would just ask uh, that we. Uh, recommend that we pass these two dockets today. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. <clears throat> Council Braden moves for passage of docket 1512. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket has passed. Council Braden moves for passage of docket 1435. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. 
The ayes have it. This docket is passed. The chair recognizes Council of Baker. Council of Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I wish to remove docket 1625, page 14 of the green sheets. Thank you, Council Baker. Um, Mr. Clerk, can you read that into the record, please? From the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation, docket number 1625. <laughs> Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $300,000 in the form of a grant for the fiscal year 23 Mass Trails Grant awarded by the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation to be administered by the Boston Transportation Department. The grant will fund the enhancement of trails and trail access in the Dorchester community. Mr. Clerk, can you poll the committee to ensure it's properly before the body? Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Worrell. Aye. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Lara. And Councilor Flaherty. Properly before. It's properly before the body. The chair recognizes Councilor Baker. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Docket 1625 was referred to the committee on October 25th, 2023. These funds will be used. These funds will be used to, a, to a, do a feasibility study for the proposed the Dot Grand Greenway, which is a uh, 0.75 mile greenway on top of the Red Line Tunnel tunnel cap between Ashmont Station and Park Street at Waldeck Street. The entire scope is expected to cost, cost approximately 700,000. Uh, capital funds from the Green Link line item are proposed to be used to supplement the 300,000. And there's wide community support for this project and there has been wide community support for my entire time on this body. And the city's working closely with the MBTA to bring this to fruition. Thank you. Council Baker moves for passage of this docket 1625. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. This docket is passed. We do have one remaining lay file matter. Oh, we do. Okay. We'll, we'll continue with the green sheets. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to uh, pull docket 1574 from page 20. Mr. Clerk, can you please um, read docket 1574? From the Committee on Ways and Means, docket number 1574. Message in order for your approval in order authorizing the City of Boston to appropriate the amount of $17,165,000 for the purpose of paying the costs associated with the boiler, roof, windows, and door replacement projects at the following schools. The Jer Jeremiah E. Burke High School, the English High School, Dennis C. Haley Pilot School and the Dr. William W. Henderson Inclusion Upper School. The City of Boston has applied for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, MSBA. Mr. Clerk, can you um, hold the committee to ensure it's properly before the body? Committee on Ways and Means, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Uh, yes. Councilor Worrell. Yes. Council Flaherty. Councilor Mejia. Council Lujan. Yes. Council Baker. Yes. And Council Braden. Yes. Properly. Properly before the body, the chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, can I just have a couple of seconds? Um, yes. Thank you. We're, we're in a brief recess.
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, on November 22nd, the Committee on Ways and Means held a hearing on docket 1574 in order to appropriate $17,165,000 for costs associated with boiler roof, windows, and doors replacement projects at the Jeremiah E. Burke High School, English High School, Dennis C. Haley Pilot School, and Dr. William W. Henderson Inclusion Upper School. On behalf of the Public Facilities Department, Brian McLaughlin, Marquise Mecca, Lisa Schwab, and Carlton Jones provide the presentation explaining uh, the usage of the appropriation. This uh, grant was part of the MSBA program that oversees the funding of public schools capital projects in the state and is part of the MSBA accelerated report program. Um, today, just asking for further action for the first vote on um, this docket. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, just um, as a chair of the committee, just asking for um, recommending it that we move and uh, that it be read properly before the body for the first time and recommend for, for, for the action or first vote. Thank you. Th thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Mr. Clerk. So we'll, we'll, do the, we'll, we'll do the roll call. So this, this vote, this will be the first roll call vote and then we'll assign it. It, then it will be assigned for further action for an additional vote at some, some other time. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Clerk, can we do a roll call vote on this docket 1574? Roll call vote on docket number 1574. Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Baker. Aye. Councilor Baker, aye. Councilor Braden. Yes. Councilor Braden, yes. Councilor Coletta. Yes. Councilor Coletta, yes. Councilor Durkin. Yes. Councilor Durkin, yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Yes. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, yes. Councilor Flaherty. Council Flynn. Yes. Council Flynn, yes. Council Lara. Council Lujan. Yes. Council Lujan, yes. Council Mejia. Council Murphy. Yes. Council Murphy, yes. And Council Worrell. Yes. Council Worrell, yes. Docket number 1574 has received nine, nine votes in the affirmative and assigned for further action. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Anything else on? Green sheets? That was it, okay. We're going back to, um, well, at this time, let me recognize <laughs> Council Worrell. Council Worrell. The late file? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd like to introduce a late file, um, a resolution recognizing November as Men's Mental Health Aware Awareness Month, and I'd like to suspend the rules and add Council Durkin as original co sponsor. We're going to, I'm going to ask my colleagues to vote to ensure that this is part of the uh, official agenda. All those in agreement with adding this late file matter into the official agenda, please say aye. 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 All those in opposition, please say nay. This late file matter has been added. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Council President. When, uh, oh. Okay, uh, Mr. Clerk, can you read that docket into the record? Offered by Councilor Brian Worrell, resolution recognizing November as Men's Mental Health Awareness Month, whereas November is uh, Men's Health Awareness Month dedicated to bringing awareness to a wide, wide range of men's health issues with a particular emphasis on mental health, and be it resolved that the Boston City Council recognizes November as Men's Mental Health Awareness Month and encourages initiatives and discussions aimed at promoting men's mental health, reducing stigma, and fostering a health, healthier and more supportive environment for men to seek the help that they need. Thank you, Mr. Clark. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President Flynn. Um, as this month comes to an end and the holiday season is in full swing, I wanted to take a moment to encourage all of, all of us to check in with ourselves and those we love. Too often, this time of year can especially weigh on our mental health and many suffer in silence. 
There are many barriers to seeking support for our mental health, cost and access to the stigma. Men in particular struggle with societal norms and expectations that can lead to underdiagnoses of health conditions and tragic outcomes. There was a study in the US that nearly one in 10 men experienced some form of depression or anxiety, but, then, but less than half seek treatment. That same study shows that black and Latinx men are even less likely than white men to report mental health concerns or seek treatment. Nationally, men are nearly four times more likely than women to commit suicide. If you are struggling with a mental health concern, sometimes family members and friends stepping up and empowering you is all you need to start your journey toward healing. For those who may be suffering, I want to say that I know that you may feel that you are carrying a heavy load alone and you feel unseen, but I want you to know that we see you and our community is here for you. Please reach out to the support you need and you can call or text the Behavioral Health Hotline in Mass at 833-773-2445. And that number again is 833-773-2445. Today I'm filing this resolution to formally recognize November as Men's Mental Health Awareness Month to remind men in our city about the importance of their mental health and to create more open dialogue around this critical issue. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell, this important resolution. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Durkin. Councilor Durkin, you have the floor. I want to thank um, Councilor Worrell for important focus on this issue. Um, we find that different communities access mental health care at, at, at different rates, um, including uh, the difference between uh, men and women and communities of color and folks that don't identify in, in that. So I'm really excited um, about this awareness and I think um, for us to end stigma um, in our society and in our city around mental health care, we need to make it um, incredibly easy and, and out in the open. So um, so just wanted to share that I'm wholeheartedly in support of this. And then I also wanted to add that, um, you know, something that came up in my hearing for um, mental health for city workers was the encouragement um, from Dr. Uh, Kevin Simone, our um, chief of behavioral um, health in the city was that he really encouraged everyone in our city um, to to get a monthly wellness check and and a check in with a therapist. Um, I encourage all of our colleagues. Um, I am, am in the process of scheduling my um, yearly checkup, and I hope that everyone um, knows you know to end stigma in our city. We have to walk the walk and and do the work ourselves. So I'm really happy to join on to this and thankful for your um, for your focus on this, Councilor Well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dirk. And the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to uh, the lead uh, sponsor and co-sponsor to for filing this. Um, mental health for our, our men in, in our society is extremely important. Um, as a mother of two sons, two stepsons, that would be four sons, um, and 13 foster sons um, over the span of 15 years of my life, um, this this is an issue that I think is extremely important. I think that I wanted to echo uh, Councillor Worrell's point about destigmatizing mental health um, illness and treatment. I think that most of us are not really privy to how the systems are set up or accessed because of that lack of information. So making it available, not just destigmatizing it, but also making it accessible in a way that folks can um, easily understand it um, and uh, making it user friendly. So that means that we are beginning to we be break down what that is, what treatment looks like, and I don't see a lot of that education around. Most of the times when parents go to um, bring their children to treatment, um, a lot of the times parents don't understand what's in the child's um, uh, file. And so if you don't understand the diagnosis, then how could you possibly support a treatment plan? Um, and so being a mental health provider, I provided um, in-home therapy and school-based school, school, um, school uh, focused uh, mental health services. 
um, for several years, and um, I have to tell you that most parents, especially parents of boys, don't necessarily understand how to uh, maybe follow up with certain suggestions at home. And so I've seen this all too often, and as, you, as we encourage people to get treatment, we also have to encourage people for uh, access to alternative medicine. Um, as we know that you know, diet and exercise and other types of alternative methods are three times more impactful and effective in most cases in mental health treatments. So um, making it accessible but also creating resources so that we can provide a, a, um, other resources as well. Thank you so much um, for filing this. I really appreciate you bringing aware to, awareness on this and hopefully we can collaborate and provide some uh, programmatic or uh, maybe projects in our districts on this. Thank you. Thank you, Council fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Council louis Jean. Council louis Jean, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to thank the sponsors, um, Council Rowell and Council Durkin, just rising to say this is incredibly important and we need to find ways to support more men's support groups so that folks have a safe space to talk. I don't know if you mentioned it, Council Rowell, when you were speaking, but things like Kings Amongst Kings, folks that are come together to really support safe spaces for men, especially men of color. Just because society doesn't really create that safe space for men, like there's all these expectations without creating the space for us to really think about mental health, both the type of mental health that's gonna require you to see a psychiatrist and be medicated, um, and the type of mental health that's just, you need a shoulder to lean on that's maybe not your intimate partner that will take strains off of you, you know, stresses off of the intimate partner where you have somewhere else to turn. So I just wholeheartedly support this, and I think that this is especially true for our marginalized groups uh, and historically excluded groups like black men. So I'm wondering if in the year to come, if there's work that we can do with the Office of uh, Black Male Advancement and the Commission, Black Men's Commission, to really think about how we support uh, more men's group making, creating more spaces where men, all people really, but men specifically in this situation feel comfortable talking about mental health issues. I think that would go a long way in addressing a lot of the issues that we see when it comes to gun violence, when it comes to loneliness, when it comes to a lot of just issues that are really hard to talk about. So just saying thank you to my colleagues for, for, for bringing this to our attention. Thank you. Thank you, Council louis The chair recognizes Council Coletta. Council Coletta, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and I'm also just quickly expressing gratitude for my colleague, Council Rowell, for bringing this uh, to the floor and, and highlighting it. And um, thank you to Councilor Durkin for discussing your own personal journey. I think that that's in incredibly brave, um, and bravery is contagious. So every single time we talk about this on the floor, um, we know that somebody hears us and they see, oh wow, our leaders are also going through this, or they know that it's an issue, and so they might find um, some relief in their own lives or encourage others to, to seek the same. So I do echo the calls of accessibility by, my, uh, by Councillor Fernandez Anderson, and um, understanding that there are a lot of barriers still to getting therapy, and, and um, the ability to talk to somebody is super expensive. For, for folks, especially if they don't have um, health insurance. So just understanding that this is an issue and um, I hope to work on it in partnership with you all and just expressing gratitude, so thank you. Thank you, Council Coletta. The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I stand to thank Brian. Um, I think men and boys have been suffering quite a bit for quite a long time and we're just starting to talk about it now. Um, coming from a family that suffers with depression, suffers with anger and, and rage, um, and suffers through addiction. <clears throat> it's difficult, life is difficult. <clears throat> and not just for black men. Everybody talks about especially black men, especially black men. Yes, absolutely black men. But white men and white boys also, we're all suffering. I've, I've had a very difficult couple of years here. I've suffered. Um, so I just thank you. When, when um, John Adams was going through the Continental Congress, it was a six-week trip by horseback. His wife would always say to him on the way out there, the door, Abigail, strong women. Um, she would say, don't forget the ladies. And it took that long to bring women to the table. But now women are at the seat of the table. You guys are in charge now, it's clear. Women are at their seat at the table. You're running show. Don't forget the boys. Don't forget the boys and men, please. Um, and I hope in my next life, 
which starts in a couple weeks, I hope to be filling a void that is, is exactly that. And, and not just for men and boys, and not just for black boys or white boys or this boy or that boy, all boys, all people that need, that need help. Um, life has become very, very difficult. And probably COVID, COVID exposed a lot of our weaknesses that we have in society. And let's try as best we can to be more welcoming to everybody that's different from us. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Council Baker. The Chair recognizes Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to Councillor Worrell for bringing forward this very important uh, topic. Um, I, I think one, I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, the folks who work in, uh, with our youth in, in working to develop uh, wellness and self-care strategies. Uh, in Alston Brighton, we have a group called the Alston Brighton Pauses, it's, uh, uh, and they work with um, youth in our schools. They have a youth leadership group that uses the COPE Code, which is a, a, a program that's developed by the, that's used by the Boston Public Health Commission to help young people develop self-care and resiliency so that they're better able to um, manage their stress uh, and their mental health without resorting to using substances such as alcohol or, um, or drugs. So I just want to give a shout out to that work, and also, you know, we need to develop these these resi this resi mental resiliency at a very early age. So supporting our young people in schools, uh, and developing uh, self care practices, uh, and I'm also a huge advocate for uh, participation in arts and and sports in schools as a way to help support our young people with their mental health, and develop good good uh, habits and good practices that will stand them well in the rest of their life. So uh, thank you, Councillor Worrell, for this uh, initiative and for flagging this up as an important issue. This should be part of our awareness every every day and every month. Every every month should be mental health awareness uh, because I think that is, that is where um, there's a huge amount of stress uh, in modern life and uh, we just try to equip everybody to uh, be as resilient as possible as they as they ha travel this journey. Everyone has their own personal journeys, and uh, different people have different ways of coping. But we're trying to develop healthy practices for our young people would be would stand them well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. I would also add that for veterans that are not engaged in the VA medical system. The mental health and the medical care at the VA facilities are exceptional. I would encourage any veteran that's watching this program or needs more information to reach out to me or reach out to Rob Santiago, who's the Commissioner of Veterans Services. But the VA has excellent medical and mental health services. They're located at Causeway Street next to the Boston Garden. They're at Jamaica Plain, and they're in West Roxbury as well. Again, want to say thank you to Council Worrell for bringing this important resolution forward. <clears throat> please raise your name. Please raise your hand if you'd like to add add your name, Mr. Clark. Please add Council Baker, Council Braden, Council Clutter, Council Durkin, Council Fernandez Anderson, Council Eugene, Council Murphy. Please add the chair. Council Worrell seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of this late file matter. All those in favor, say aye. I all opposed say nay. This late file matter has been added, has been adopted. <clears throat> At this time, let me recognize Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I have an announcement because uh, today is my son's birthday, and. Um, I, I usually try to keep my um, children's life private, especially the, little, the, the younger one who's in high school. Um, recently, um, you know, a certain newspaper posted his name and um, his information um, just to try to um, tarnish my reputation. And it hurt me, but I know how much it would mean to him to rise up and say, wish him a happy birthday. Um, I'll, Shaq is 
amazing. He is high honors. He's taking at least three college courses. He goes to, he attends the best high school in Massachusetts, seriously, um, and is all high honors and completely amazing. So he's an inspired artist, but he's also a computer programmer um, who does really well. This kid, he does his own laundry, <laughs> he cooks, he counts his macros, he makes sure that he is in shape, he goes, he attends, goes to the gym every day, um, and is participating in all of these different clubs. He's well aware, he is uh, progressive, he's serious, and um, I'm just extremely, extremely proud of him. I know that um, I'm biased, of course, but honestly, um, I don't know where these kids came from. It's like God just dropped them in my lap, and I was like, who are these great kids? But they're amazing, um, and just, you know, happy birthday, Shaq, I love you, thank you. Thank, thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. And on behalf of the entire body, we want to wish your son a happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. We're on to the consent agenda. I, I have been informed by the clerk that there are zero additions to the consent agenda. The chair moves for adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The consent agenda has been adopted. We're on to memorials. We're going to adjourn our meeting in memory of the following. For Councilor Arroyo, Antonios Elias. For Councilors Flynn Baker and Flaherty in Murphy. Frank Jankowski, Boston Police Officer, Vietnam Veteran. For Councilor Louis Jen. Latanya Jones Henderson, Michael Jimmy Hollis, Ronnie Vaughn Baptista, Bacalo Marshall, Zakarian, Daniel Gaskin, K.R. David, for the entire City Council body, former First Lady Rosalind Carter, John Walsh. A moment of silence, please. The Chair moves that when the Council adjourns today, we do so in memory of those individuals mentioned. We are now scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, December 6th at 12 noon. Before we adjourn, I want to say thank you to the clerk, the assistant clerk, city council central staff, to my colleagues, and to um, your staff as well. And I could never forget the stenographer. <laughs> thank you to the stenographer. <laughs> All in favor of adjournment, please say aye. aye. The council is adjourned. Thanks, Frank.